It's great to be here. Um, and thank you for joining. I'm going to be talking about perimplantitis, uh, etiology, diagnosis, prognosis, um, treatment, and maintenance. Uh, thank you for the nice introduction. I, I received my dental education in uh, an undergrad education in Virginia and my specialty training at Ohio State University. I practice with my wife, Dr. Lourdes Christopher. Uh, let me go ahead and uh, um, go right to it. Our uh, practice is in Falls Church, Virginia. We practice in a building that has uh, about 10 other dentists and we collaborate uh, with each other all the time and we unfortunately witness cases like this every day. And uh, these perimplantitis cases uh, sometimes are iatrogenic and sometimes uh, it's just uh, because of the patient uh, not being compliant and sometimes there's unknown reasons. Uh, so the patients affected are not necessarily patients with poor oral hygiene. In this case, the uh, uh, patient is uh, the uh, spouse of a dentist. Uh, this patient is a son of an endodontist. This patient is, a, is an orthodontist. So this affects uh, everybody. So uh, let's go over the definitions first. The um, first definition is, uh, you know, peri-implant mucositis. That's similar to gingivitis, uh, where the inflammation is uh, not spread to the bone and it's just confined to the soft tissue. The second uh, um, definition is peri-implantitis, where the inflammation is spread to the bone around the implant. And uh, the term peri-implant diseases uh, uh, includes both peri-implantitis and peri-implant mucositis. This is the standard terminology that is used now and uh, the whole reason for that is to emphasize the role of inflammation uh, in how this uh, process uh, uh, causes damage to the body. The older terminology with uh, ailing implants, uh, uh, failing implants was confusing, it wasn't very precise and uh, uh, we should not uh, use those uh, uh, terms anymore. Ailing implants were implants that had pocketing and some sort of bone loss that for some reason they were ex ac acceptable because probably they were stable and failing implants were implants that had uh, pocketing, separation and progressive bone loss and if there was any mobility uh, that was a failed implant and I, I think that part is still valid now. If there's any implant mobility the implant uh, is failed or failing. Um, so my definition of perimplantitis is uh, implant purgatory. It, you don't know whether um, uh, you're going to keep the implant or um, the implant is going to survive there. Uh, patients are confused, doctors are confused as far as what to do. And uh, unfortunately, some of these cases, like in this case, uh, you see peri-implant mucositis that uh, is not affecting the bone, uh, so uh, in, in one, some areas, and in some areas it is. And uh, in the old literature, this is considered a success, even though in our clinical practices, this would be an embarrassment. You know? so, um, so whatever the incidence of peri-implantitis uh, and peri-implant mucositis is, uh, uh, it, it, it doesn't matter as much because uh, even uh, one or two cases are going to affect our practices and have a large impact. Uh, this is the first implant that I placed in private practice and I had to see the patient for a different reason about 15 years later and I was very happy to see that there was not much bone loss there even though I used an old technique, uh, an obsolete implant and uh, you know um, this is a Good reminder that another definition for implantitis, peri-implantitis, is that its lack of existence it, it is an uh, indication of long-term success in implantology. And also, this is a good indication that we should maybe de-emphasize the materials we use and the te techniques uh, uh, and look at um, you know, uh, other things that can maintain the bone because in this case I use the obsolete technique and obsolete material basically and have good results. Um, um, Periimplantitis definition should not be confused with uh, the saucerization or the formation of biologic width around the implants. That is a normal uh, remodeling that occurs. Um, the 
big question is how much bone loss is normal. And uh, basically, there was a work, 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 uh, not a, uh, sorry, European workshop on periodontology uh, in 1994 that uh, said that the initial bone loss of 1.5 millimeters for the first year is normal and 0.1 to 0.2 millimeters uh, each subsequent year is expected. Um, going with the calculations for, from the 1994 European workshop, this implant that I placed 14 years ago should have 4.3 millimeters of bone loss and be considered success. So this just shows that um, the old uh, uh, um, the, the old view uh, on how much bone loss is normal uh, is not valid and it's not uh, making any sense anymore. This is a more uh, contemporary report by the American Academy of Periodontology uh, looking at peri-implant mucositis and peri-implantitis. Um, the prevalence uh, is about 4% to 47%. And that's a really wide range because we have uh, problems with our diagnosis system with implants that uh, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, briefly. Uh, but basically, this uh, paper is also a really nice paper because uh, they reviewed the literature about the risk factors and they came up with residual cement being on top of the list and poor plaque control, inability to clean. Um, was a determining factor for developing peri-implantitis, um, previous history of periodontitis, and then um, some other factors uh, that uh, were involved uh, were listed in this paper, like smoking, genetic factors, diabetes, occlusal overload, and then um, not um, reported in this paper, but, uh, but later in the discussion, I'm going to talk about more, re more evidence that we have um, that uh, it's becoming clear how important professional maintenance is as far as reducing the prevalence of uh, or incidence of uh, peri-implantitis and inadequate creatinized tissue uh, can cause bone loss um, and unstable implant connections, emergence profile, we're going to talk about that. But one of the reasons that range 4% to 47% such a wide range is because our diagnosis is not um, uh, really um, uh, robust in showing us uh, exactly what's going on. Some clinicians don't, don't even report early um, bone loss because, uh, you know, um, when is it biologic width formation, where, when is it bone loss, um, you know, so um, they, they, they don't report, um, you know, four millimeters as being peri-implantitis for uh, and then, um, so this paper talks about how we should have a better diagnosis uh, or classification for peri-implantitis, and hopefully that will give us a much better idea of the, the, the uh, prevalence of this problem. But as I mentioned earlier, it doesn't really matter what the exact prevalence of peri-implantitis is because it still impacts our practices greatly. This is a case I did about 17 years uh, before I saw, I took these x-rays in uh, April of 2015. This patient walked into our office um, and uh, in front of a patient sitting in the waiting room said that I'm here because the doctor's implant has failed. And so I brought her back in the chair, took x-rays and noticed that these implants were placed by me 17 years prior to this date. And uh, the bone level around the implants generally look great for uh, 17 years, but um, the implant in the site of number 15 presented with bone loss. And uh, so basically, whether deserved or not, we are blamed and, uh, for this problem, and it's a problem that we need to find solutions for so that we have less, less case, uh, of uh, situations like this and more situations like the rest of the implants. Did. So there is a philosophical question as far as uh, peri-implant disease being a complication. Is it expected or is it normal? Um, a, a normal event is expected, uh, whether it's desired or undesired. Um, for example, someone who has um, an implant surgery, it's expected for them to have some swelling or some discomfort. Um, but what about bone loss? Uh, so. 
the way I have the conversation with patients is uh, from the beginning, I let them know that uh, in some cases, it is expected to have some bone loss, uh, some implants in some patients, and I document that and have it as part of my consent so that uh, patients uh, are, are aware of what they're getting into because it seems that uh, um, peri-implantitis, even though it's a complication, that it's not avoidable. So, uh, by definition, periimplantitis is an inflammatory process, and so it is similar to periodontitis in that regard. And being a periodontist, I, uh, I am very familiar, and I, as periodontist, dentist, hygienist, who are participating tonight, I know that you deal with periodontitis, uh, periodontal diseases all the time, and so there are a lot of common factors that uh, we have between periimplantitis and periodontitis, but there's also some differences. Uh, there's obviously no cementum, no periodontal ligament uh, around implants, and basically uh, um, there are factors with periimplantitis that we don't deal with in periodontics. Uh, that has to do with implant design, surface roughness, microgap, biomechanics of uh, the implant components, and, uh, and things like that. So, what I'd like to do is uh, emphasize the commonality of periodontitis and periimplantitis first and uh, show you that there's plenty of evidence that says, at least historically, this is very related. Uh, even though we know inflammation drives both uh, scenarios, but also historically, if a patient had periodontitis in the past, they are more at risk of developing periimplantitis. Peri and if the uh, history of periodontitis was aggressive periodontitis, then they are, the patients are even more at risk of developing periimplantitis in the future. And, and so what I'd like to do is talk about lessons that we can learn from managing periodontal disease to understand how we can better manage periimplantitis and periimplant disease. So, some of the, just a quick review of periodontal disease or chronic periodontitis, it's an uh, inflammatory problem that causes uh, bone loss. Uh, it's driven by bacteria, and uh, what causes the bone loss is the host response. Um, so different people have different response to the bacteria. Some don't display much bone loss, and some have severe bone loss because of their genetic makeup sometimes habits like smoking um, uh, or hygiene uh, uh, um, play a big role. And uh, so what uh, we learned from peri periodontal disease management is that early diagnosis uh, can uh, translate to better outcome and surgical therapy and regeneration is possible. So um, because of the central role of bacteria microbiology, uh, with uh, the pathogenesis and etiology of both periodontitis and periimplant disease, I'd like to review microbiology uh, very briefly. Um, so the microgap, the cemental colonization, deep pockets, lack of colonization, lack of cratinized tissue contributes to bacterial colonization. Bacteria cause inflammation. Inflammation causes a reaction by the host pro-inflammatory cytokines like interleukin-1, IL-6, TNF-beta, um, osteoclast activating factor is another name for interleukin-1. They, they, they are responsible for the bone loss that we see in periodontitis and periimplantitis. So the main culprits um, are AA, uh, actinobacillus actinomycetin comitans or agrobacter, and I'll talk about that in a second, and the black pigmented bacteroides, which now they're not classified this way anymore, PGPI and spirochetes. So, so the main problem with periimplantitis and with periodontal disease uh, with uh, periodontitis, especially with uh, juvenile or uh, now what we call aggressive periodontitis is AA actinobacillus agrobacter, and uh, that we can call the ace of spades. Um, it has some nasty features. It, it can hide inside cells just like a virus. It changes gene expression to cause 
more colonization. It's a cop killer because it produces leukotoxins, which kill the good guys, the white blood cells, the neutrophils, and the macrophages that form the first line of defense. Um, uh, it produces proteases that degrade antibodies, collagenases that break down tissue, and AA is not touched by penicillin type of antibiotics. Um, and it also is a spore former causing problems even if uh, you, um, you somehow um, um, kill it. It can just act dead for a long time and then germinate again and cause problems. Another one uh, that is always associated, most of the time associated with periodontitis and uh, periodontitis is PG bacteroides gingivalis, which we now call porophyromonas gingivalis. And again, this acts like a virus uh, hiding inside of the cell, so the immune system has trouble seeing it, and it produces a lot of nasty proteases, proteinases that cause tissue destruction. Uh, Provatella intermedia uh, um, can thrive on fatty acids uh, like the ones produced in um, estrogen and uh, uh, can uh, be the link with some of the uh, systemic uh, factors that we see with periodontitis or periimplantitis. Spirochetes are known for their motility and mobility and the spread of the disease from one side to the other. And so, so this is a um, very brief review of microbiology and our old technique of culture and sensitivity in order to find the culprit and uh, have the antibiotic to treat it doesn't work as well because it only works for aerobic bacteria unless we send the anaerobic samples and collect them and, and somehow manage to uh, not kill them in the transport process and also be able to grow the bacteria. So a better way is DNA testing which is now available and you can, uh, you can uh, take a salivary sample and uh, get a report of uh, different bacteria that are there um, and their uh, virulent factors, uh, you know, or their clinical significance uh, are listed in these reports that are very nice. But unfortunately, they uh, are not going to be the answer because bacteria work in teams. And uh, Sopransky and Hafeji basically uh, looked at these teams, uh, this uh, symbiotic relationship that bacteria have in order to cause uh, problems for, uh, for us. Uh, they found uh, the red complex, the yellow complex, the, the orange complex, and basically these are the um, known pathogens that we see around periodontitis, and it's uh, the same microbiology with periimplantitis. There are over 400 bacterial species in the mouth. 30 of them are pathogenic, and they exchange uh, in these teams. And in the biofilm, they change information such as uh, resistant to antibiotics. And as long as the biofilm is there, even if we kill the bacteria and we kill selected um, targets in uh, bacteria, they, the other team workers that they have uh, compensate for them and cause trouble. So, so to be effective, it's um, um, very important for us to get rid of the biofilm when treating periodontitis or periimplantitis. Biofilm is a means for bacteria to protect themselves, and uh, it's very important for us to not forget mechanical debridement, and this is not something that is going to go away with just uh, prescription antibiotics or with a mouthwash. The second lesson that uh, we should learn about periodontitis that we can uh, uh, incorporate in our management of periimplantitis is the importance of host response. Um, so what drives inflammation is bacteria, but inflammation is our host response um, to the bacteria and the inflammation causes the bone loss. And in dental school, we all had uh, this study with the laborers, in the tea workers in Sri Lanka, where they didn't have any access to oral hygiene, and uh, examiners from Europe went there and uh, examined these patients, uh, looking at different periodontal parameters over time from the 1970s to 1985, and they found that the, the, the patients, the tea workers could be um, divided to three groups based on tooth loss. Uh, there was one group that 
lost teeth early on, and uh, uh, there was a minority that didn't present with much bone loss, and then there was the um, uh, rest that uh, were in between. And, and so basically, uh, this uh, classic study shows that different people have a uh, different reaction to better pathogens. And uh, this is true also uh, with periimplantitis. This is a great example to show in this case um, um, every mistake that I know of in implantology uh, was uh, um, performed here. Um, you can see that uh, it's an obsolete implant. This is a below standard implant. You can see that this is a hard to clean scenario, but look at the bone around this, uh, these implants. It looks great. And you can see from the age of this implant, this was placed many years ago. And so why did this patient not display uh, more bone loss? Uh, is I propose that it's because of the reaction of his immune system. He is not an inflammatory person, basically. This is another one where you can see mistakes made uh, and uh, the implant still survived um, and uh, it's functioning and you can see from the age of the x-ray and the age of uh, this implant that uh, was uh, sold in the mid 80s uh, or late 80s um, that the implant is still doing great um, and uh, even though a lot of mistakes were made, uh, that did not affect the bone right here. So different patients have different reactions, just like in periodontitis. Again, this is another case of mine. I placed the implants in 2002, and you can see in 2016, there is not much bone loss, even though this is a, a cantilever design. And, uh, you know, uh, so is it the technique? Is it the um, type of implant? Um, I don't think so. This is a hydroxyl appetite implant. It's an external hex. It's a cantilever. Uh, a lot of these uh, are questionable. This is the same implant now, and you can see the amount of bone loss in this patient. So, so we cannot blame the implant for, for things, and it's very important to consider the patient's uh, reaction. This is a great example. This actually, as a, uh, he used to be my, my accountant, actually. And uh, in 2000, we had to extract his teeth. I worked with a referring doctor who uh, was supposed to restore these implants. They were placed immediately in uh, September of 2000. And uh, I saw the patient five years uh, after the implants were restored. Uh, he came to me uh, on New Year's Eve, December 31st, 2006, saying that uh, the, the, the crown was loose, and I um, suspected that he was going to um, the other, to the restorative dentist uh, many times for cementation because uh, the restorative dentist used the wrong components. They used a, uh, this is a five millimeter external hex. They used the 4.5 or the 3.7 series uh, components on this. And uh, there was a misfit. This is uh, the same patient six years later, 2012. And uh, they uh, still had a misfit. There was uh, inflammation. Um, there was cement there. But look, the bone doesn't look bad at all. And then, so this is 12 years later. And in spite of all the uh, inflammation um, and uh, poor oral hygiene, uh, the bone maintained itself really well. And I think um, with the misfit of components and all that, you would expect to have more bone loss, but in this case, we cannot minimize the effect of the host response um, because this shows that, uh, you know, the inflammation did not necessarily translate to bone loss. And this is something that we see in a subgroup of periodontal patients also. So we ended up restoring the implant with the correct components and send the patient back. This is another patient of mine. The implant was placed, and then later on, um, even though the components had a great fit, and this was a screw retained restoration, we still had uh, uh, a severe bone loss around this implant um, due to a little bit of cement. So in one case, um, all that inflammation does not translate into peri-implantitis. In another case, peri-implant mucositis 
translates to severe bone loss with periodontitis. So this is a very good overview of how to treat patients uh, that have peri-implant disease, whether it's peri-implant right, uh, mucositis or peri-implantitis. And, uh, you know, uh, the best uh, for someone who does not display bone loss is to just give them oral hygiene instructions and not even debris the area. Just like with healthy teeth that have one to three millimeter pockets, we don't do scaling because we fear that scaling and root planning can cause more attachment loss. So the same thing is true with, uh, with peri-implantitis. When um, peri-implantitis is uh, associated with bleeding or is peri-implant mucositis, then it is a good idea to include some scaling there. And if there is no systemic involvement and moderate bone loss, then maybe in addition to debridement and uh, implant scaling and debridement, we should consider guided bone regeneration. And then if it's advanced periodontitis, the best option is probably to remove the implant and have a new implant, if possible, place it. So one of the questions I get asked a lot is, where do lasers fall in this scheme? And so I want to talk about lasers for a minute. You know, and the best way to start speaking about lasers is with the American Dental Association, because I think that a lot of us agree that the American Dental Association um, has no special agenda, and uh, they, uh, they, they work really hard to, to uh, um, make life easier for their members, uh, dentists and hygienists, and they look at the, the literature and they give advice all the time. So basically, um, the statement that I have here from the American Dental Association says that any laser that we can buy out there has some sort of a FDA clearance uh, and it's called the pre-market notification, and that's how they can sell the lasers. But, but just because you have a pre-market FDA approval doesn't necessarily mean that you have FDA approval to use uh, lasers uh, specifically for peri-implant disease. So because uh, we practice in the United States, every, every equipment, the laser, has to have some sort of a FDA uh, acceptance, but whether that is uh, off-label usage when we use it around, peri around implants, uh, uh, or is it uh, the specific usage that the FDA approved it, but I tell you that uh, uh, I don't know of any laser that has specific FDA approval for treatment of peri-implantitis, and that includes uh, the LAPIT procedure or the dual wavelength with ND YAG, Erbium YAG, or the CO2 laser. Um, and uh, in some cases, lasers like the diode laser is even dangerous around teeth. So there, this is a study uh, meta-analysis of the literature published in the Journal of Periodontology in 2014. And um, you can see that when you look at conventional and look at laser, you don't, you don't see a lot of studies that favor the laser. And basically, the recommendation is that by the American Dental Association and the American Academy of Periodontology is that it's hard to see the extra benefit that lasers can provide. So there is no laser that is recommended by the ADA or the AAP, but that doesn't mean lasers are not successful. So every day I see advertisements from different companies um, and I see amazing results from my colleagues uh, using uh, different lasers. Um, uh, a company that does a really good job with marketing is Millennium, and you can see amazing results. But even though their LENAP um, and laser-assisted regeneration has specific FDA approval, they still do not have the approval for the LAPIP procedure. Uh, but I would not be surprised if in the, in the near future we get FDA approval because I know that there are a lot of laser companies looking to get that, working with different laser wavelengths. You know, um, this one is a light walker laser that has one frequency to, to disinfect the surface of the implant and another, and another frequency with the NDAC technology to get out of the inflamed tissue. This is a case I used with a DECA laser. Uh, I had to place these short implants out of concern from the inferior, for the inferior alveolar nerve. These are six millimeter implants, and 
the patient develop severe uh, peri-implantitis uh, before the implants were loaded. This patient does have a history of Fosamax. Um, uh, and so after application with the laser and also with some uh, changing of the healing abutment and antibiotics, I was able to, to remedy the situation. And so I think that there is a beneficial role with lasers and we're going to be able to see more coming from lasers in the future. This is a case where I use the CO2 laser for disinfection as I place some bone graft there and this is one year post-op and uh, the result was favorable. So lasers do have a role um, but um, they're not there yet. Um, um, at least in the scientific report and in uh, you know, the formal way. Uh, so um, one of the uh, issues that I like to really emphasize as we think to treat perimplantitis is early diagnosis. Uh, and that is very important because if we don't treat perimplant mucositis early, then it can become perimplantitis. And it's so much more uh, predictable to treat perimplant mucositis um, than it is to treat perimplantitis. Um, so, um, another thing that uh, is very important is uh, here with all of these different scenarios, uh, supportive implant therapy or maintenance recall is uh, recommended and I can tell you um, with uh, a lot of confidence that there's a lot of reports out there that, uh, that report that uh, preventive maintenance can, can be associated with a better outcome in the future. With uh, non-surgical treatment or maintenance of implants, we should avoid uh, curettes and scalers that can damage the surface of the implant. Um, but again, don't give up on traditional uh, debridement because um, subgingival debridement is a very effective and non-inexpensive therapy to treat perimplantitis, and there's plenty of research to prove that. This is a case uh, in my practice, a uh, patient had a Sargon implant um, and had developed perimplantitis. And as you know, with this type of implant, uh, the removal is uh, extra hard because uh, the, uh, the implant uh, basically spreads in the bone. So uh, removal of the implant was not a, a good option for this patient. So with just maintenance, we were able to actually get some of the bone back and control the patient while he was under my care uh, until he moved uh, out of this area. This is another case with a, a problem that we had with a, the vent of a, of a screw vent implant that uh, got infected and caused bone loss. Um, uh, it probably was contaminated from the beginning and uh, I had to do an apicoectomy on this implant and uh, it became even more critical not to lose any bone around the crest because the foundation of the implant was compromised. And this patient is under strict recall in my office. Every three months he comes in. And as you can see, we don't have much bone loss. And, and, and that is just, uh, you, you know, the power of uh, recall. This is another patient that uh, had implants placed by me uh, back in 1990s and uh, late 1990s, and when he went for the restoration, um, the restoring doctor decided to use electrosurge around this implant uh, to control bleeding. Uh, back then, um, he didn't know much about implants, uh, and then so the restoring doctor caused the necrosis of the bone, which adhered to the implant, and I had to open a flap and remove the necrotic bone, which, uh, as you can imagine, was full of uh, spirochetes and all those bacteria that I talked to you about, and I wanted to clean this and make it a maintainable situation. And so after I removed the necrotic bone, I, I went ahead and, and did a titanium plasty, basically converting the surface to a surface that was better manageable with maintenance recall. And as you can see, in the past 17 years, I've been able to maintain this implant with just maintenance recall. And um, uh, again, the, the power of uh, recall cannot be minimized. There are some off-label usage for 
debridement of implant surfaces, just like lasers. Uh, you could use off-label area abrasion, but you have to be very careful about potential harmful effects of the chemicals that are used. Uh, and there are a lot of different off-label uh, things that you could use. Just because they're off-label doesn't mean that they're not going to work, but uh, in the future, we hope to have more research that shows us what works and what doesn't work. Um, the Cochrane database has uh, looked at a lot of the information when looking at randomized control trials uh, regarding perimplantitis. They even contacted manufacturers for any papers that, that they can identify for them. And they found that a lot of these adjunct treatments that you may think work actually do not provide an additional benefit. Um, Subgingival application of antibiotics um, can cause a reduction of probing depth, uh, have a beneficial effect by about a half a millimeter. But bone grafting around implants uh, can, can be much better, uh, about three times the effect, or one, about one and a half millimeters. Um, and um, again, I cannot emphasize enough the impact of supportive periodontal therapy as far as long-term success with implants. Um, there is a lot of misinformation out there, and sometimes the misinformation is uh, with good intention, or it's just because it's uh, old, outdated information that we're looking at, and things have changed. And, uh, you know, you have to, uh, again, remember our implants are relatively new to our profession. And so, there are some um, guidelines that sometimes don't apply, just like that 1994 guideline from the European uh, workshop in periodontology that was saying that uh, uh, progressive bone loss around implants should be recognized as normal. Well, this is another report from the European um, workshop in periodontology, uh, and they uh, said that there is no evidence that so-called regenerative procedures have any additional benefits around treatment outcome. And, and that, that is something that I do not agree with because I have cases where I've done gingival grafting or bone grafting, which I'll show you here, that had a great beneficial um, um, effect for my patients. In this case, the bone loss was because of colonization of bacteria, because of inadequate gingival tissue, as you can see here, and then so the remedy was to perform uh, debridement and scaling and gingival grafting, and then all, all, that's all we did, and we were able to get the bone to come back and then manage the patient in our recall program. In this case, uh, there was some bone loss uh, and inflammation, periimplantitis, around implant place uh, around tooth number five. You can see the extent of the bone loss. We went out of our way to not cause further recession. So this is a little bit unconventional flap design, but the purpose is kind of like to tunnel under here and try to clean. It took a lot of time, but I was able to clean really well. Place some bone graft there with calcium sulfate instead of a membrane back in 2005 and uh, have uh, great results almost 10 years later when the patient left my practice. So, so there is a place for bone regeneration around implants, and we should not give up on implants sometimes too easily. You can see the date the x-ray was taken, 2008, and you can see the bone loss here. And uh, again, what is the implant purgatory uh, situation here? Are we going to remove this? You know, often these patients are older, they are of fixed income, and uh, they are looking for solutions to keep um, their implants here. Simple bone grafting with a membrane, and I was able to maintain this implant for the patient. The surgery is not very complicated. It's just a, a you know, flap, uh, degreedment, bone grafting, and a membrane. And then so then the outcome is absolutely significant for the patient. And again, with these implants, you can see these implants have been around for a long time. They're old implants, and again, the patients are not getting any younger, and they have a lot of bone loss. They're not ready to remove this. They're more frail. They have more medical problems, financial problems. And so if you can do things to keep the implants for the patients, uh, uh, it's a great service for them.
This case in 2008 presented with uh, peri-implantitis combined with periodontitis right under a papilla here. And this is a female patient who is in uh, her 40s, I think, you know, back in 2008, and she did not want to remove the implant or her teeth. And so with some bone grafting and changing the components, there was a misfit component here that I changed, placed some implant, uh, some bone graft there, and then changed the restoration provisionally. And after we were confident with the prognosis of the implant, changed the restoration to um, uh, something more cleansable and maintainable. And uh, about 10 years later, we still have both the tooth and the implant, and we have much more bone that supports both. This is how the case presented in 2008, and there was a lot of peri-implantitis, um, mainly because of a misfit uh, uh, below par uh, abutment component, which I removed, and I just put a, a provisional abutment there after debridement and scaling and made it temporary for her on the same day. And then oh, over time, as we got rid of the inflammation, we also did a uh, um, periodontal procedure to make her smile look better and got rid of the inflammation. Again, we use uh, um, debridement. I also use the CO2 laser in this case. Um, uh, so peri-implant disease, um, uh, the consensus report uh, from the six European workshop doesn't uh, apply. It's time for them to uh, come up with new recommendations. Uh, uh, bone grafting around implants should be considered a serious option in spite of what, they, uh, what that uh, workshop uh, suggested. This is a patient who is 74 years old. The implants were placed in, in the 1990s. You can see by the type of the implants, these are older external hacks um, and all different kinds of implants. She has a lot of bone loss, and basically she was told that she has to remove all of these implants and get new restoration, new implants, but she cannot afford it anymore. Her husband has passed away. She has limited income. And then so she was looking, looking for other options. So here I, I did some bone grafting for her in March of 2016. And then this is uh, March of 2017. You can see that a year later, the situation is so much better. And I um, I was able to regenerate a uh, minimal amount of bone, which uh, basically changed uh, the situation and uh, made uh, the maintenance much easier, not only because of the bone feel, but also because I, I smoothened the rough surfaces or the, uh, I took off the, the threads of the implant, making it a more uh, maintainable implant uh, in terms of managing peri-implantitis. And again, these are examples from day-to-day uh, -day practice. You can see this actually was taken today. I asked this patient to come in for a one-year post-op in uh, April last year. I uh, treated the bone loss around the last implant. He had, he spent a lot of money paying for these implants and this nice bridge work on top of the implants. And unfortunately, he developed uh, severe peri-implantitis and uh, fortunately, we were able to manage the situation with bone grafting um, for the patient. Um, again, um, in this case, the implant was uh, maintained for nine years, even though I would not be surprised if most dentists would recommend extraction of the implant in 2007. This is the case I showed you with the, uh, with the bone loss with a little bit of bone loss around the implant and uh, the sinus step was done and after the cement was removed and bone graft was placed, uh, the patient had the bone come back and uh, so bone grafting works around implants in some cases and it's a great service to patients. Uh, LPRF, IPRF, uh, laser debridement, these are things that can make our peri-implantitis management more successful. But in some cases, uh, the uh, regeneration of bone is minimal, but again, the surgery can change the, uh, the situation to a more maintainable situation. In this case, I was not able to get much bone regeneration, but I was able to 
make the implant surface smoother and better for maintenance. So now at the end, I'd like to talk about some of the factors that are not in common with peri-implant type, with periodontal disease, and it are specific to, to uh, peri-implantitis and uh, don't share much with, with uh, the periodontal part. Um, so these are factors uh, that we should really consider in order to be able to minimize the effect of peri-implantitis and the prevalence of that in our patients, cement, emergence profile, fit of components, we talked about that, micro and macro geography, uh, ge sorry, geometry of the implants, implant surfaces, uh, the uh, effect uh, of emergence profile leaving a different footprint on the on the bone, we, we have to take these considerations as, as we make a decision about which implant type to use and how to design the, the prostheses. Um, there are certain considerations with implants that are not something we deal with normally with periodontitis, uh, effect of inter uh, implant distance, uh, the management of the micro gap, there are implants that can move the micro gap away from the bone uh, by having a collar, collar or, or, or having a platform switch where the micro gap is medialized away from the crestal bone causing less um, resorption of bone and uh, that is uh, scientifically proven and also the role of micromotion on, uh, on uh, the uh, crestal bone. Uh, really nice work by Dr. Ziprich and Regal about looking at different connections and the stability of these connections and how much um, um, distortion you, you get under force, on the lateral force and potential micro leakage of toxins and pathogens and uh, the effect is different with different implant surfaces and implant connection types. And so one of the uh, implant connections that I really don't like, um, and I see a lot of problems with, is the flat-to-flat -flat connection. I like to see more of a conical or more taper connection um, so that, uh, you know, we don't have uh, uh, bacterial uh, colonization and micro leakage. Just like in dental school, we, we were told to use chamfers instead of butt joints. This is more like a chamfer. This is a butt joint. This is much better as far as not allowing um, bacterial colonization. So in this case, I have a really nicely placed implant by one of my colleagues, and uh, they uh, placed the implant, did a beautiful job with the restoration. They used the screw retained restoration, but this patient has peri-implant mucositis, which is a source of uh, inflammation for her. And after I removed the, the components, you can see uh, the uh, weakness of this connection as far as bacterial colonization and uh, the effect it has on the soft tissue inflammation. Um, again, the same kind of flat-to-flat uh, -flat connection with uh, separation. This is the same patient that had a, a much better implant connection and, and she had a flat-to-flat -flat connection by someone else who did an implant there. And, and look, so we cannot say this is the patient. So implants play a role. The type of connection plays a role. And uh, that is basically uh, evidence-based. Uh, There's a nice study by Dr. Cooper that talks about the effect of the connection. And also the design of the prosthetic is a key factor. I'm, I'm sorry I'm going really fast because of uh, consideration for time. I want to finish this on time. So this is a really nice study by uh, Minka Vickius that looked uh, from Lithuania that looked at, um, you know, even, uh, you know, with, with um, uh, a uh, benchtop access for cement removal, it's very hard to remove cement. And as uh, the abutment design was modified, there was less and less cement that could be collected and weighted in the research. So, so basically, he made the abutment crown complex so that he can remove it later and examine the cement and found that uh, managing uh, the cement is much easier if the implant restoration is designed to be able to do that. And obviously, the best way to restore implants, in my opinion, is uh, uh, if we could avoid cement. And this is a screw retained, uh, sorry, the cement retained and, and you can see the bone loss that was there. And when I opened the flap, I could identify the, the cement particle and remove it. So the take-home message is avoid 
Cement, if possible. There was a webinar on this system uh, earlier by Darwin from Implant Direct that talked about uh, different techniques that you could uh, use to minimize uh, cement around implants and also, again, the thickness of tissue, uh, the uh, work by Linkovicius about uh, cratinized tissue around implants uh, is very important in managing um, and maintaining uh, peri-implant bone. Uh, my wife uh, had her master's uh, project with Dr. McGlumphy at Ohio State and uh, the late Dr. Peterson, who was a oral surgeon at Ohio State, and she found that uh, she, come, she looked at different surfaces and the effect of uh, peri-implant bone to different implant surfaces. She found that he, uh, the HA implants had better survival rate, but with patients with oral hygiene that was poor or inadequate cratinized tissue, there was more incidence of peri-implantitis. So you can see that implant manufacturers uh, like the sponsor tonight, Implant Direct, uh, uh, which had nothing to do with uh, the uh, material that I, I put in there, but I, I was able to uh, get a copy of this from them about their new legacy P implant. P is for peri-implantitis management. So this implant allows, has a dual surface with rough and smooth, and then so this implant is much easier to maintain, God forbid, if peri-implantitis develops, and like those cases that I showed you, I don't have to go in and create a smooth surface and make the implant surface smoother. This is kind of built in. So as a periodontist that who manages implants, um, this type of implant can, can be a great uh, help for my practice. And um, the type of implant, uh, is important, but it does not give you immunity from bone loss. Uh, this is an implant, uh, Astra implant. They have uh, a lot of research over the years about the maintenance of uh, crystal bone with this system versus the standard norm, they call it. And in spite of that, I used the, the system and I still saw that this implant did not protect my patient from bone loss. This is even before loading and now, everything is stable, but this is not what uh, I, uh, I, they, they were advertising. So basically, uh, even if you use a very good premium implant with a lot of research, that doesn't give you immunity from peri-implantitis or peri-implant disease. In this case, this is a much less uh, researched implant uh, advent uh, from Zimmer compared to the AstroTech implant, and you can see beautiful bone over time. So, so basically, uh, implants are important, but no implant can give you immunity. And uh, at the end, I know we, we are out of time, but at the end, I just wanted to uh, talk about an important issue. This patient had bone loss around his implants. The implants were placed correctly. These were screw retained. There was no cement there. And unfortunately, there was some bone loss. When I investigated, I found that uh, she's a hygienist. She was flossing really hard three times a day. And I think that this pattern of bone loss, because it's not circumferential, may be because of the flossing that, that causes this damage. Because she actually showed me, she passes the super floss between these joint implants. And uh, uh, um, so the floss issue is something that uh, has been mentioned. Uh, this is a... Uh, uh, the doctor who came up with Console Pro, and you know, he has a lot of experience over the past uh, decades with implants. Uh, he's saying 10,000 implants, and he talks about the effect of flossing around the implants because the uh, connection of the soft tissue to implant is much more fragile than uh, uh, the periodontal attachment that has Sharpie's fibers. Uh, he said that uh, sometimes peri-implantitis can be due to flossing. And in this case, we have a problem with cement. We change it for the patient. And in spite of doing, uh, making screw retained restorations, we saw this, again, pattern of bone loss, which is not circumferential. And I had the patient show me, and he showed that he was uh, flossing too aggressively. We, we did some bone regeneration to save the implant, but... This is something that is uh, showing up more and more in the literature. Uh, flossing around the implants has the potential to, to be risky. And uh, you can see that sometimes, especially with the foam floss, 
or wax loss, you can cause damage to the implants. This is another report by Dr. Lang um, um, that was published uh, last year in clinical or implant research. Uh, you can see the amount of FOSS. Some patients uh, leave around the implants and the damage uh, wax loss can make on implants. And uh, uh, you have to be careful as these implant surfaces becoming rougher, the damage can be significant. It's okay to use uh, floss around implants, but you have to be careful, especially with the foam floss that can get stuck and cause a um, um, foreign body reaction. Uh, again, for the sake of time, I'm going to conclude right now and see if there's any questions that we can answer. Okay, so um, um, thank you for the aggressive flosser cases. What is, uh, is it still considered perimplantitis if there is bone loss and inflammation three months after implant placement, or is it non-integration? Very good question. So basically, uh, researchers are modifying their protocol, so they allow for, uh, uh, for six to eight weeks after the implant is placed before they look at parameters because they are saying that it's not perimplantitis necessarily if it's uh, earlier than, um, than that. And so um, typically perimplantitis needs more time to develop. Another question is, uh, so more taper internal uh, with hex seat and with implant core smaller than implant diameter base choices these days? Yes, I think that the more taper, the more stable the connection is and the more uh, fitting the implant is, uh, I think uh, the better. Um, how does doing a titanium, titanium plasty help with bone regeneration. Uh, the surface of the implant um, is contaminated with periimplantitis and basically it's very hard to do a good job um, removing the contaminants and uh, even if you use citric acid or laser and uh, also in terms of maintenance, um, the rougher the surface, the, the, the better the colonization of bacteria, and so the titanioplasty in my hands, what I have been doing is modifying the implant surface so that we can uh, eliminate bacteria better, and by eliminating the bacteria, you have less inflammation and then more opportunity for the body to regenerate bone. I would imagine many of these implants are different brands. How do you know what instruments are needed or correspond to the implants? Um, I, that's a great question. Um, I think that um, different implants uh, have their own uh, um, um, characteristics that uh, more or less once things happen under the bone, if it's away from the connection and it's a problem with the middle of the implant, then they, it really doesn't matter what type of implant it is. It, uh, what matters more is the implant surface. And uh, unfortunately, with the peri-implantitis bone grafting, there's going to be recession anyway. So different types of implants don't have that much of an effect if we're dealing with uh, bone loss in the middle of the implant. Do you feel use of ultrasonic or piezo scaler is good or bad for implant maintenance, especially if um, peri-implantitis or peri-implant mucositis is present? There is a study. Um, uh, that is in the American Dental Association website. Uh, I can email that to you. That shows that there is no difference between ultrasonic, um, piezo, and hand instrumentation. But in my office, uh, we like to use uh, ultrasonics when we can. Stay within the implant brand family of parts. Um, yeah, so that's really good. I like to use Implant Direct because uh, they um, have a lot of different implants with different connection types, and some of those connections I do not like, and some I do like, and I like to work with a company that doesn't make that decision for me and leaves it to me, uh, being the doctor, and I use the right connection that I think is right, and I can buy it from them. And um, so, again, um, uh, that's one of the advantages uh, of using a supplier that uh, sells different type of implants. So I think we could uh, end it there and then uh, wait for emails. Uh, uh, if, uh, if we can take it there, then Lisa, I can answer the questions with email.